Okay, so this morning we are going to continue with our series. In fact, we're going to end our series this morning on Proverbs, just part one of Proverbs. We may come back to it uh, sometime in the future, but for now, as we can move, start moving into Advent, uh, we need to f- change focus. And so I thought it was appropriate that we simply uh, looked at uh, what it means to walk in wisdom to walk with the wise and so uh, I've entitled this morning walking with the wise or walking in wisdom and I want you to please turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 6 Proverbs chapter 6 you remember we spoke quite a lot from Proverbs 6 when we looked at uh, sluggardliness and looked at the ant and considered its ways and so on and we are going to revisit this this chapter as we look at what it means to walk with the wise. Uh, In your notes, there are a number of different scriptures there which I really encourage you to read through. Um, Many of them we'll be quoting through the course of this morning's message. But please go away, use your notes, revisit some of the stuff that we've been saying, and may it really continue just to speak to us and challenge us through the week. But before we get into it, let us bow our heads in a word of prayer, shall we? Lord, we just thank you for your word, and thank you again for this amazing way that you teach us through your word, and the incredible truths that help us to live our lives as we just take hold of your word and apply it to our everyday walk with you. And we ask this morning that we would learn to walk with the wise, that you would again remind us of these truths so that we might live our lives fully for you. We just thank you again for the privilege of every day having access to your word to be able to read uh, the revelations that you impart to us. And we ask that today may be no different as you open our hearts to receive your word. And so bless this time together we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The people in your life can be your greatest spiritual asset or they can be your greatest spiritual curse. You can gather around you the right people who lift you, who encourage you, who equip you, who feed you spiritually. Or you can gather around yourself those who do exactly the opposite. They drag you down, they discourage you, they don't feed you spiritually, in fact they rob you of your joy and your commitment to Christ. And they end up being very toxic people in your life. And I'm quite sure that you can think of people in your life, either right now or in your past, who either had a positive or a negative influence on you. How many of you can honestly admit this morning that there are some people in my life right now I can think of who after spending time with them, something of who they are has rubbed off on me. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. The deception of the enemy is to get us to believe that the opposite is true. That good company can actually lift bad character. So if I'm good and I'm with that person, they will be influenced and become good too. And Paul says, that's a fallacy. He says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Good character does not change bad company. More often than not, the bad company is going to pull you down 
rather than you pull them up. 2 Timothy 2.16, Paul says, avoid godless chatter. And then he says a very interesting thing. Why should you avoid godless chatter? Because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. And then he goes on to say that what they say will spread like gangrene. You see, the bad thing about gangrene is that it can start from just a tiny, small infection. And then the very blood and life stops flowing to a particular part of the body. And that part of the body literally dies. And that is a graphic picture of what wrong friendships can do to someone who is otherwise healthy, someone who is otherwise godly and spiritual. But when we have the wrong people around us, that bad company corrupts good character. Some of you work in environments or maybe play in environments where profanity flows like a polluted river all day long every day. Can profanity rub off? Some of you work in businesses or industries where the whole goal of the business is to grow the bottom line, no matter what it takes to do so, no matter what methods are employed, can greed rub off? I remember going to a rugby game when my son was playing, I think it was under 13, at Collegians in Durban. And right towards the end of the game, there was this skirmish among the forwards as there so often is and they started bashing one another and they got into the usual fist fight and then the final whistle went and I thought okay you know these things happen they're only kids and I turned around and to my absolute horror there were about five or six men going at it hitting one another throwing each other down the stand and going absolutely ballistic and I just thought you know, I could not believe my eyes that parents could get so involved that they would start fisting one another. And so the question arises, can anger and violence rub off? If you go to certain parties or gatherings where the main goal is just to drink as much as you can, let me ask you, can over-drinking rub off? And so we could go on. But you see, the opposite is also true. Last two days, we were at this Global Leadership Summit. And you're praising God with probably seven, 800 people around you. You don't even know these people. But they're all singing their lungs out, hands lifted in the air, praising God. There's a spirit of worship rub off. Maybe at your workplace, in your department or division, it is headed up by a very friendly, happy, positive woman who has that same demeanor right through the day and it kind of lifts the spirits of everybody in the organization. Can a positive, friendly spirit rub off? Maybe you go to a local gym and you try to get some exercise. And every time you're there, you just see some people who are just giving it their all. They're doing their sets, they go all out on the apparatus, they're drinking their protein shakes, the whole deal. Do healthy workout habits kind of rub off on you? 
when you're on the treadmill kind of walking at a very leisurely pace and the guy next to you is going flat out sweating like a pig, you not kind of feel a little bit guilty that maybe you're not quite upping your game. It starts to rub off on you. Maybe you're at a 12-step meeting, listening to another addict, sharing their story, admitting their mistakes, committing to live a different way in the future. Does their courage rub off on you? You see, friends, the writer of Proverbs, the teacher is so aware of this unalterable reality that he kind of cries out, let's stop kidding ourselves. We're all going to be affected to some degree by those we hang out with. So let's wise up, let's get our heads out of the sand and start choosing the right people who surround us. Choose your friends wisely. I bump into somebody you haven't seen for some time. And they kind of greet me and I try and re re recollect where I saw them. And they say to me, do you remember me? And I sort of trying to think. And then they say, I used to come to, you, to your church. You know, I came on an alpha course and became a member, you know, that orientation thing we went through. And... Now, things were going so great in my life back then. And then, then I met this guy, and, or I met this, this girl, or this woman, and I started, or I started hanging out with these guys at the office, and we went off and had some drinks after work every Friday night, and then it was Saturday night, and, and then, you know, I found myself just a bit broken to come to church on Sunday, and before I knew it, you know, I, I just wasn't coming to church anymore. And, you know, to be honest, my life's a bit of a mess right now. There's just so many bad decisions I've made and things just aren't working out. And, you know, it's good to see you, but gee, just, you know, spare a prayer for me when you get a chance, won't you? And I tell you, I've had that conversation with so many people. People who said, you know, I was good with God. I started... I then started hanging out with the wrong people. I started going their way instead of God's way. And now my life's hit a, hit a new low. See, this is what I know about friendships. What makes a friendship so great is the very thing that makes a friendship so dangerous. Because when you're with a friend, you tend to drop your guard. The reason we are attracted to certain people is because we, we're all acceptance magnets. We are repelled by rejection. We are attracted to acceptance. And I'm, when I'm with people who accept me, I tend to drop my guard. I tend to drop my guard so that I can be one with them. So that they'll carry on accepting me. So that the group will carry on accepting me. And you see, that acceptance leads to influence. And so often it is bad influence. Think about how many times when you were growing up, when you did something that was really bad, either at school or after school, there was somebody with you that made you get up to that mischief or whatever it was. You see, bad company corrupts good character. And I want to say, friends, your greatest regrets in life will not revolve around your enemies, but around your friends. And if these are not good, godly, healthy friendships, then you need to be on your guard. They are toxic relationships that will drag you down and that will take you back into the world until you no longer have any care for the things of God. 
And so Solomon, who, as we've said, we believe is the writer of Proverbs, says in chapter 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise. You see, that's the promise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. That's the warning. Wisdom is contagious. If you surround your, your, yourself with people that the Bible considers to be wise, it's contagious. You will, by nature of proximity to them, become wiser. Simply by being in the company of and walking with those people, doing life with those people, you'll become wise. But notice that the warning is not that when you're in the company of fools, you become a fool, but simply that you will suffer harm, that they will influence you negatively. And maybe some of you have tried to defend an unhealthy relationship, a toxic relationship in your life this way. And you said, but, but I, I don't do what they do. I don't kind of joke around like they do. I don't say the things they do say. I don't participate in the things they participate in. You see, I'm, I'm safe. I'm okay. And Solomon says you're a fool if you believe that. You're dead wrong because the companion of fools, whether you adopt their lifestyle or their mindset or not, you will eventually be harmed by that fool's behavior. They will be toxic. They will be like a poison which Paul also speaks about. So what is a fool? We've spoken about this before, friends. What is a fool? A fool is a person who knows the difference between right and wrong, but just doesn't care. You say to a fool, don't you know where that's going to lead you? They just laugh and say, yes, but you know, I don't care. I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. And so if you're a companion of a fool, guess what? you'll probably also cross that bridge when you get to it. And you will suffer harm. You'll suffer the same consequences that they will. Because that's what the Scriptures teach. So who are your friends? Who are the circles of people that you spend a lot of your time in? that you party with and you bry with and you go out camping with and whatever. Who are those people? Because you see, the Bible is very clear that bad company corrupts good character. You see, if you're in an unwise relationship with someone who doesn't care about his or her life, they're not going to be too concerned about yours either. If you're in a close friendship with somebody who isn't too worried about the state of their marriage, believe me, they won't be too concerned about the state of your marriage either. If you're mixing with parents who don't really care how they discipline their children and how they raise their children, and you spend a lot of time with them, and your kids spend a lot of time with them, after a period of time, you'll become like them. And you won't really care about discipline either. If you mix with people who are flippant and careless with their finances, they'll be careless and flippant with yours if you give them half a chance. So what this means, friends, is whether you ever think like them or not, whether you ever behave like them or not, whether you participate in the same things that they participate in or not, it's a dangerous place to be. 
because the companion of fools bears the consequences of the fools themselves. And so here in Proverbs 6, Solomon issues a warning. And interestingly, he doesn't say that these are the people you must not associate with. But it is implied, if you look at verse 16 to 19. Because here he describes seven character traits that are offensive to God. That if you see these traits in people, they should really flash big red warning lights. Danger. Hazardous. Roads ahead if you continue to walk with these people. And so there are seven character traits that are offensive to God. They are character traits of the kind of people that you do not want in your inner circle. And if you see any of these traits in someone, you need to be on your guard. Yes, you need to be nice to them. Yes, you can speak to them. Yes, you can pray for them. You can maybe meet a need in their life. You can point them to Jesus. You can invite them to church. You can do all of those things. But be very careful about inviting them into your inner circle. Why? Because bad stuff rubs off. Bad stuff rubs off. So according to Solomon, who should we then not invite into our inner circle? Who are, what are the character traits of those that God hates? Well, listen to it in verse 16. These are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to Him. Now that's a pretty solemn sentence just right there. They are detestable to God. And if they're detestable to God, then... Why on earth are people like that in your inner circle? Do you really think you are not going to be influenced by them? So the first one is someone with haughty eyes. Now the word haughty we don't use today, but it was an ancient word to describe pride and arrogance. Someone who looks down on others. Someone who says, I matter, you don't. I'm sophisticated, you're very ordinary. I'm educated, you're ignorant. I'm beautiful, you're very plain. I'm married, you're single. I'm spiritual, you're worldly. And maybe there are some in your inner circle this morning who have haughty eyes, who are always looking down on others who are always elevating themselves, who are filled with pride and arrogance. James says, God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And then in Proverbs 16, 18, the verse that we all know so well, pride comes before a fall. What else does pride do? It rubs off. It rubs off. And you're going to have a real tough time developing humility if your close friends are full of pride and full of, full of arrogance and are continually looking down on others. A lying tongue. We've spoken about this a few weeks ago. Speech has got to be honest and not deceptive. And we quoted from Proverbs 12, 17, a truthful witness gives honest testimony. You see, it's tough to become a truth teller. It's tough to be honest when you're surrounded with people who are always dishonest, who are always lying, telling untruths who are always deceiving, 
Because sooner or later you will start lying and deceiving. And you'll think nothing of it. Because your closest friends will not look down upon you when you do it because they are doing it. And so Solomon says, do not have people like that in your inner circle. Those who lie. Those who deceive. Then thirdly, hands that shed innocent blood. Now he's not suggesting that you don't invite an axe murderer into your inner circle. That's kind of obvious. Now if you look at Proverbs, when it speaks about innocent blood, it goes a lot broader than killing somebody. Solomon is really saying, be wary of people who oppress the weak. Beware of those who dominate others. Beware of those who throw their weight around. Who like to stick it to other people. Beware of mean-spirited people. And when you hear people speaking, you need to be aware, you need to be aware of them and beware them because the red light should be flashing. I don't know about you, but violence of any form is something that we should hate. Whether it's in cruelty to animals or whether it's with human beings, Some people get pleasure out of two boxes knocking the stuffing out of each other. But you know, for me, violence is just so contrary to the nature of God, the heart of God. It's so out of sync with His nature. Jesus modeled nonviolence. Even when the soldiers came to arrest him, Peter took out his sword and cut off the soldier's ear. What did Jesus say in Luke 22? No more of this. No more violence. Even if it's to, it's to defend me, no more violence. And we spoke about this two weeks ago when we spoke about revenge. Do not take revenge. No more violence. And he reaches out and he picks up the ear and he heals the servant. Jesus modeled nonviolence. When others were violent toward him, what did he do? He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You see, friends, it's hard to cultivate a heart of gentleness and peace and compassion if you surround yourself with people who love violence who love the kind of violent stuff that is out there because stuff rubs off They've shown pretty clearly that all these terrible incidents that have happened in the U.S. over the years, starting with Columbine and continuing into other schools and bars and so on, all that hatred and all that violence originated with kids playing violent games on their computers, engaging in violent acts, filling their minds with violent images until eventually they want to carry those same things out on others. You see, if you surround yourself with people who are angry and violent, 
It'll rub off. How many times do you come from a meeting where people have been venting and screaming and shouting? Somebody shared with me this morning as they're going out of church that they've been elected to a board, a body corporate, you know, one of the complexes. And when they sit together, these people are just full of anger and, and malice, screaming at each other and so on. And she was just saying, I, I don't know what to do. I think I must step away. And I said, absolutely. Don't surround yourself with people who are just going to feed your soul with negativity and violence and hatred. The next two danger warning lights that are flashing we can do together, hearts that devise evil schemes and feet that run rapidly to evil. I spoke some weeks ago about how a fool lies awake at night scheming how they can get ahead, how they can outdo their competition, how they can come up with get-rich schemes, plans for business ventures that prey upon the poor, that exploit others, scams of one kind or another. And Solomon says, don't be around people who are devising evil schemes. You can always tell when someone is devising a plan or promoting a scam and justifying it. And again, you can pray for them. You can even warn them. And if they're going to violate a, a, some kind of law, you might caution them and say you, you, you need to report it. But more than anything, Solomon just says, don't hang around with such people. Because very soon you will be complicit in the devising of these evil schemes and you will start justifying your doing it. Stuff rubs off. Some of you are building a business and it's hard enough running a clean, high integrity business today in a very grey world. The temptations are enormous around you, especially when your competitors seem to be doing better than you. And you start mixing with them, and you start going out to a bar with them, and talking shop with them. And you wonder why after a while you start thinking about other ways of improving your business, and improving the bottom line. And you start doing the things they're doing. If they do it, why can't I do it? You wonder why you can't come to church anymore. Because of the guilt that you're struggling with. Because you know in your heart of hearts that what you're doing is contrary to God's word. So Solomon says, don't gather around you people who are continually devising evil plans and schemes. Because after a while, you'll join them. Are you hearing me, church? Be careful of the friends you make. Be careful of the people you have in your inner circle. Don't think it's not touching you. It is touching you deeper than you know. And then Solomon says, beware of false witnesses. He's already spoken about lying. Why does he mention false witnesses again? It seems to be a theme that Solomon is reminding us of over and over again. And we spoke a lot about this when we spoke about the power of gossip and the power of slander. Somebody who breaks down somebody else by spreading false witness about them. Is beware of false witnesses. Beware of those around you who, who tell lies about others, who break others down in your company. Don't associate with such people. Why? Because, friends, it is obvious, and yet some people just cannot see it, that if somebody is prepared to lie about somebody else, 
to you, they prepared to lie about you to somebody else. So why are you associating with such people? Because you think that you're, they're your big mate and that they're your friend and then behind your back they're saying all kinds of evil things about you. They're giving false witness. More than often to try and justify their own wrong action or behavior. And Solomon says, don't associate with them. And then lastly, he says, beware of the one who spreads dissension among brothers and sisters. The NIV, it says, a person who stirs up conflict in community. And there's always somebody like that, isn't there? There's always somebody who will stir up conflict. Somebody who is dissentious. Solomon says in Proverbs 16.28, a perverse person spreads strife. How many perverse people do you have in your inner circle? You don't have to be around someone very long to discern if they fundamentally polarizes or unifies. Whether they are bridge builders or bomb throwers. How often does it not happen when you're in the company of others and you're standing around a bry and you're talking and somebody suddenly gets onto a topic of hate speech against a group or against an organization, whatever it is, and before long you find everybody is just sucked into that and you're all talking about it and we're all guilty of it. Bad company corrupts good character. You might be a really good person and you very rarely speak evil of others until you're in the right environment and it's toxic enough to start feeding your soul with all this negativity and before long you start bad-mouthing everybody. Stirring up dissension. Speaking hate and negativity over everybody around you. A perverse person spreads strife. That is exactly why Paul says, as far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all people. As far as it depends upon you. In other words, friends, every one of us has a choice. Every one of us can extricate ourselves from that company. We can remove ourselves from bad company. If you really want to, you can do that. When stuff starts happening and people start saying certain things, you have the power of decision, remember which is what prompted the series in the first place. You have the power to say, I will not be part of this. I will not be party to breaking down this person or this group or this organization, whatever it is. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Are you associating with bridge builders or are you associating with bomb throwers? And if you're trying to become a more reconciling person and you're wanting to live more at peace with those around you, then get some bridge builders around you, friends. And keep yourself as far away as possible from bomb throwers, polarizers, people who sow discord and dissension. You can pray for them. You can invite them to the church where hopefully they learn more about the greatest bridge builder and reconciler the world has ever known. But just don't hang out with those people. Because bad stuff rubs off. As we close this morning, 
as we close this series this morning. It's time for us to walk with the wise. It's time for you to redefine some of your friendships. And it's time for some of you to forge new friendships with those who will build you up and encourage you and feed you spiritually rather than rob you of your joy and your passion for Christ. Some of you, like that person this morning, maybe needs to go away and consider your role in a particular group, on a particular committee that is toxic. And maybe it's only your pride that's keeping you there. Because everybody looks to you and thinks they can't do without you. Maybe it's time for you to say, actually, it's time for me to move away. And I want you to know the reason I'm leaving is not because I'm not adding value, but because I cannot continue in this toxic environment anymore. Because it's destroying my soul. And I get home and I take it out on my family. And you've got to make some tough decisions. Can I say it as directly as I can, friends? Some of you are suffering harm. You're being held back. You're getting beaten down by the very people that you call your friends. But in reality, they no longer are being true to the definition of friendship. They're no longer cheering you on anymore. They're no longer looking out for your well-being. They're just looking out for their own well-being, maybe at your expense. The Bible says that if you continue in that relationship, maybe for something that you can gain, maybe you're thinking that in the end you will gain something, and the Bible says you're a fool. The Bible says what does it matter if you gain the whole world, but you forfeit your soul? Some of them just want you to stay in the same rut that they're in. The same rut that maybe you joined them in. But now you know, because of your walk with God, it's time to move on. And maybe you need to sit down with a person or two and very kindly but firmly say to them, I've got to move on with my life. I cannot any longer associate with some of the, the people that you're hanging out with. Whenever I do pre-marriage counseling, and some of you have been through that, you will know that I always ask a couple of questions. What do you think of his friends? How do you get on with his friends? And I say to him, how do you get on with her friends? I asked that question once and the couple both answered, no, I, I can't stand his friends. They are just horrible people. And likewise, when I asked him and I said, you've got to deal with this because believe me, there'll come a time in your marriage when those toxic relationships will destroy your marriage. And in one instance, the marriage did not last one year. One year, and they were separated. And I bumped into her after a year, and I said, what is the cause of the breakdown of your relationship? And she said, and I won't say his name, but he just refused to let go of his friends. And every Friday night, he went out with them, and every Saturday night, he was with them. And he did everything with them. And he just left me and the baby to fend for ourselves. And I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, did I not tell you that when we sat together in my office 
14 months ago. She nodded her head and said, yes, but he just didn't want to get rid of his friends for me. See, friends, bad company does corrupt good character. And some of us have to make some crucial decisions in the next few days. Who you get to retain in your inner circle and who you maybe need to walk away from. Not in an ugly way, not in a holier-than-thou way, but just quietly remove yourself because you know that this influence is rubbing off on you and it's not what God wants for your life. Walk with the wise. Walk with the wise. Let's heed God's wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.